Section 23, page 110. Very well, tomorrow evening, he repeated, inwardly resolved that he will not go early, and that by reaching her door late he would either prevent her from going to Mrs. Tutter's or else arrive after she had started, which, all things considered, would no doubt be the simplest solution. It was only half past eight, after all, when he rang the bell under the wisteria, not as late as he had intended by half an hour, but a singular restlessness had driven him to the her door. He reflected, however, that Mrs. Stutter's Sunday evenings were not like a ball, and that her guests, as if to minimize their delicacy, usually went early. The one thing he had not counted on in entering Madame Alaska's hall was the fine hats and overcoats there. Why had she bidden him to come early if she was having people to dine? On a closer inspection of the garments besides, which Nastasia was laying his own, his resentment gave way to curiosity. The overcoats were in fact the very strangest he had ever seen, under a polite roof, and it took but a glance to assure himself that neither of them belonged to Julius Beaufort. One was shaggy yellow ulster of reach me down cut, the other a very old and rusty cloak with a cape, something like with a French called Macfarlane. The garment, which appeared to be made for a person of prodigious size, had evidently seen long and hard beer, and its greenish black folds gave out a moist, how does the smell? suggestive of prolonged sessions against barroom walls. On it lay a ragged grey scarf and an odd felt hat of semi-scrilicker shape. Arco raised his eyebrows, inquiring at Nastasia, who raised her returns with a fatalistic Gaia as she threw open the drawing room. The young man saw at once that his hostess was not in the room, then, with surprise, he discovered another lady standing by the fire. This lady, who was long, lean and loosely put together, was clad in raiment int intricately looped and fringed, with plates and stripes and bands of plain color disposed in a design to which the clue seemed missing. Her hair, which had tried to turn white and only succeeded in fading, was surmounted by a Spanish comb and black lace scarf, and silk mittens, visibly darned, covered her rheumatic hands. Besides her, in a cloud of cigar smoke, stood the owners of the two overcoats, both in the morning clothes that they had evidently not taken off since morning. In one of the two, Arker, to his surprise, recognized Red Vincent, and other and older, who was now unknown to him, and whose gigantic frame declared him to be wearier of the MacFarlane, had a feebly lion on head with crumpled grey hair, and moved his arms with a large paving gestures, as though he were disturbing lay blessings to a kneeling multitude. These three persons stood together on the heart rock, their eyes fixed on an extraordinarily large bouquet of crimson roses, with a lot of purple pansies at their base that lay on the sofa where Madame Anaska usually sat. What they must have cost at this season, though, of course, it's the sentiment ones care about. The lady was saying in a sighing staccato as our crew came in. The tree turned with a surprise at his appearance, and the lady, advancing, held out her hand. Dear Mr. Arker, almost my cousin Nivland, she said. I am the Marchioness Manson. Arker bowed, and she continued. My Ellen has taken me in for a few days. I came from Cuba, where I have been spending the winter with Spanish friends, such delightful, distinguished people, the highest nobility of old Castile. How I wish you could know them. But I was called away by our dear great friend here, Dr. Carver. You don't know Dr. Agaton Carver, founder of the Valley of Love community. 
Dr. Carver inclined his linen hat, and the Marchioness continued, Ah, New York, New York, how little the life of the spirits had, has reached it. But I see you do know Mr. Vincent. Oh, yes, I reached him some time ago. But not by that route, Vincent said with his dry smile. The Marchioness shook, shook her head reprovingly. How do you know Mr. Vincent? The spirit bluffed where it's listed. Lists, oh, oh, list, interject Dr. Carver in a stentorian murmur. But uh, sit down, Mr. Acker. We have, we four have been having a delightful little dinner together. And my child has gone up to the rest. She expects you. She will be down in a moment. We were just admiring these marvelous flowers, which will surprise her when she reappears. Vincent reminds on his feet. I'm afraid I must be off. Please tell Madame Olenska that we shall all feel lost when she abandons our street. This house has been an oasis. Ah, oh, but she won't abandon you. Poetry and art are the bread of life to her. It is poetry you write, Mr. Vincent. Well, no, but I sometimes read it, said Vincent including the group in a general note and slipping out of the room. A caustic spirit on peu sauvage. But so witty, Dr. Carver, you do think him witty? I never think of it, of it, said Dr. Carver severely. Ah, uh ah, -uh, you never think of it. How merciless he is to us weak mortals, Mr. Acker. But he lives only in the life of the spirit. And tonight he is mentally preparing the lecture he is to deliver presently at Mrs. Blanker's. Dr. Carver, will there be time before you start for the Blanker's to explain to Mr. Arker your eliminating discovery of the direct contact? But no, I see it is nearly nine o'clock, and we have no right to detain you while so many are waiting for your message. Dr. Carver looked slightly disappointed at this conclusion. But having compared his ponderous gold timepiece with Madame Alanska's little traveling clock, he reluctantly gathered up his mighty limbs for departure. I shall see you later, dear friend, he suggested to the Marchioness, who replied with a smile. As soon as Ellen's carriage comes, I will join you. I do hope the lecture won't have begun. Dr. Carver looked thoughtfully at Arker. Perhaps, if this young gentleman is interested in my experiences, Mrs. Blanker might allow you to bring him with you. Oh, dear friend, if it were possible, I am sure she would be too happy. But I fear my Ellen counts on Mr. Arker herself. That, said Dr. Carver, is unfortunate. But here is my card. He handed it to Arker, who read on it in gothic characters. Picture with gothic characters writing that Agatha Carter, the Valley of Love, King, King Scotman, and D as a business card. Dr. Carver bowed himself out and Mrs. Manson, with a sigh that might have been either of a regret or relief, again waved Arker to a seat. Ellen will be down in a moment, and before she comes, I am so glad of this quiet moment with you. Arker murmured his pleasure at their meeting, and the Marchioness continued. In her love's high in accent, I know everything, Mr. Dear Arker. My child has told me all you have done for her. Your wise advice, your courageous firmness, thank heaven it wasn't too late. The young man listened with considerable embarrassment. Was there anyone, who, he wondered, to whom Madame Olenska had not proclaimed his intervention in her private affairs? Madame Olenska ex exaggerates. I simply gave her a legal opinion, as she asked me to. Ah, but in doing it, in doing it, you were the unconscious instrument of, of what the world have we modern for providence, Mr. Arker, cried the lady tilting her head on one side and drooping her lids mysteriously. Little did you know that at the very moment I was being appealed to, being approached, in fact, from the other side of the Atlantic. 
she glanced over her shoulder, as though fearful of being overheard, then driving her chair nearer and raising a tiny ivory fan to her lips, breathed behind it. By the count himself, my poor, mad, foolish Alansky, who asks only to take her back on her own terms. Good God, Arker exclaimed, springing up. You are horrified. Yes, of course, I understand. I don't defend poor Stanislas, though he was always called me his best friend. He doesn't defend himself. He casts himself at her feet, in my person. She tapped her emaciated bosom. I have his letter here. A letter? Has Madame Alanska seen it? Arker stammered, his brain reeling with the shock of the announcement. The Marchioness Manson shook her head softly. Time, time I must have time. I know my Ellen. Haughty, intractable, shall I say. Just a shade unforgiving. But good heavens, to forgive is wanting, to go back into that hell. Ah yes, the Marchioness accused So she described it, my sensitive child. But on the material side, Mr. Arker, if I may stoop to consider such things, do you know what she is giving up? Those roses, they're on the sofa, I crest like them. Under glass and in the open, in his much less traced gardens, at Nice. Jewels, historic per pearls, the Sobeski emeralds, sables. But she cares nothing for all these, art and beauty, though she does care for, she lives for as I always have, and those also surrounded her. Pictures, priceless furniture, music, brilliant conversation. Ah, that, my dear young man, if you will excuse me, is that, is what you have no conception of here. And she had it all, and the homage of the greatest. She tells me she is not thought handsome in New York, good heavens. Her portrait has been painted nine times. The greatest artists in Europe have begged for the privilege. Are these things nothing? And the remorse of an adoring husband. As the Marchioness Manson rose to her climax, her face assumed an expression of ecstatic retrospection, which would have moved Arker's mirth had he had not been numb with amazement. He would have laughed if anyone had foretold to him that his first sight of poor Madar Manson would have been in the guise of a messenger of Satan, but he was in no mood for laughing now, and she seemed to him to come straight out of the hell from which Ellen Alaska had just escaped. She knows nothing yet of all this, he asked abruptly. Mr. Manson laid a purple finger on her lips. Nothing directly, but... Does she suspect? Who can tell? The truth is, Mr. Arker, I have been waiting to see you. From the moment I heard of the firm stand you had taken, and of your influence over her, I hoped it might be possible to count on you on your support, to convince you that she ought to go back. I would rather see her dead, cried the young man violently. Ah, the machinist murmured, without visible resentment. For a while she sat in her armchair, opening and shutting the absurd ivory fan between her mittened fingers, but suddenly she lifted her head and listened. Here she comes, she said in a rapid whisper, and then pointing the bouquet on the sofa. Am I to understand that you prefer that, Mr. Arker? After all, marriage is marriage, and my niece is still a wife. Chapter 18 what are you two plotting together, Aunt Madara? Madame Alaska cried as she came into the room. She was dressed as if for a ball. Everything about her shimmered and glimmered softly, as if her dress had been woven out of candle beams, and she carried her head high, like a pretty woman challenging a room full of rivals. We were saying, my dear, that here was something beautiful to surprise with you. Mr. Manson rejoined, rising to her feet and pointing arcly to the flowers. Madame Alaska stopped short and looked at the bouquet. Her color did not change, but a sort of white radiance of anger ran over her like a summer lightning. Ah, she exclaimed, in a shrill voice that the young man had never heard. 
who is ridiculous enough to send me a bouquet. Why a bouquet? And why tonight of all nights? I am not going to a ball. I am not a girl engaged to be married. But some people are always ridiculous. She turned back to the door, opened it, and called out, Nastasia. The ubiquitous handmaiden promptly appeared. An archer heard Madame Alaska say, in an Italian that she seemed to pronounce with intentional deliberateness in order that he might follow it. Here, throw this into the dustbin. And then, as Nastasia stared protestingly, But no, it is not the fault of the poor flowers. Tell the boy to carry them to a house three doors away. The house of Mr. Vincent. The dark gentleman who dined here. His wife is ill. They may give her pleasure. The boy is out, you say. Then, my dear one, run yourself here. Put my cloak over you and fly. I want the thing out of the house immediately. And, as you live, don't say they come from me. She flung her velvet upper cloak over the maid's shoulders and turned back into the drawing room, shutting the door sharply. Her bosom was rising high under its lace, and for a moment Arker thought she was about to cry, but she burst into a laugh instead, and looking from the marchioness to Arker, asked abruptly, And you two have made friends. It's for Mr. Arker to say, darling, he was waited patiently while you were dressing. Yes, I gave you time enough, my hair wouldn't go, Madame Olanska said, raising her hand to the heaped up curls of her chignon. But that reminds me, I see Dr. Carver is gone, and you will be late at the Blankers, Mr. Arker. Will you put my aunt in the carriage? She followed the Marchioness into the hall saw her fitted into a miscellaneous heap of overshoes, shawls and tippets, and called from the doorstep, Mind the carriage is to be back for me at ten. Then she returned to the drawing room, where Arker, on re-entering it, found her standing by the mantelpiece, examining herself in the mirror. It was not usual in New York society, for a lady to address her parlor maid as my dear one, and send her out on errand wrapped in her own opera cloak. And Arker, through all his deeper feelings, tasted the pleasurable excitement of being in a world where action followed on emotion with such Olympian speed. End of the section, page 117.